Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles, the Friday podcast all about your Kindle. I'm Len Edgerly. Today is January 5th, 2018. Happy New Year to you from downtown Denver. On New Year's Eve, the city's fireworks decorate the sky about four blocks away from our apartment, so that makes our apartment living room a great place to watch the 9 p.m. show an hour before the ball drops in Times Square. (laughs) By midnight, we are usually sound asleep. My first guest of 2018 is Tom Semple, a software quality engineer in California whose take on all things Kindle and Amazon benefits from experience and attention to detail. He always understands what's new, but does not always immediately adopt it. I looked at the Oasis, the new one over at the Amazon Books in San Jose over here, and I, you know, I, I, just, I just don't need it. I, I really, you know, my voyage is really great. I don't really have any complaints about it. So. Also this week, a look at what Amazon might buy in 2018, more bad news for Barnes & Noble, an Irish betting site's handicapping of the HQ2 sweepstakes, and how much fun an Amazon fanboy can have at the new Whole Foods in downtown Denver. Plus, in the tech tip, I will offer a mild rant about Kindle bookmarks. First up in news are some fearless Amazon predictions by Jason Del Rey, a talented tech writer for Recode. Del Rey began by mentioning talk of Amazon's acquiring Nordstrom or Target. He characterized those possibilities as being mainly in the fun category, but he does think it's actually possible to make a strong case for Nordstrom. More realistic acquisitions he wrote include XPO, an $11 billion freight transportation and warehousing company. XPO does everything from managing warehouses to owning its own fleet of freight trucks to setting up last mile delivery of big items like furniture and appliances a category that Amazon does not yet currently dominate or really have much of a presence in. On the retail side, Del Rey suggested Amazon might buy the Boston-based Wayfair, a fast-growing online furniture seller with a market value of about $7 million. The most tantalizing and crazy rumor he has heard in the past few months is that Amazon might be interested in buying Costco, the $83 billion retailer that has continued to thrive in the Amazon era. Just beneath the headline of the Recode piece, Jeff Bezos is shown striding toward the camera looking more buff than nerd. It's by now kind of a famous photograph, and the caption reads, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos is coming for you. It wouldn't be an Amazon purchase, but I agree with listener Mark Jarvis, uh, who a couple of weeks ago said he would love to see Bezos add a second newspaper, The Guardian, in London to his personal portfolio. Compared with Costco or XPO, the Barnes & Noble bookstore chain looks like a bargain after its stock fell 15% this week, reflecting a 6.4% decline in comparable sales this holiday season compared with last year. The chain's share price fell to a 24-year low of $5.52, and that calculates to a market value of just $407.6 million according to a story in the Financial Times. That would be a quick way to expand the number of Amazon bookstores, which now total 13, with three more set to open soon in Bethesda, Maryland, Austin, Texas, and Georgetown in the District of Columbia. Austin and D.C. have been frequently mentioned as strong contenders for HQ2, Amazon's second corporate headquarters. Denver started out with some buzz, including a top place finish in a New York Times analysis, but lately I'm seeing less touting of our Mile High City. That didn't keep our governor, who is a personal hero of mine dating back to when Darlene and I waved honk for hick signs for him at busy intersections during his unlikely first election as mayor 14 years ago. Here is Colorado's governor. John Hickenlooper making the pitch, mentioning day one, and almost pronouncing Amazon's founder's name correctly. We're a can-do, that kind of Western attitude that's exemplified Amazon. You know, it's day one. Uh, You look at how Denver and Colorado have recreated ourselves in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years as the most pro-business state in America, but with the highest environmental standards, the highest ethical standards. That's kind of what Amazon is trying to reinvent uh, you know, a lot of the economic structures in this country, but with high standards. Mm-hmm. And I think that's an important connection. When the CNBC interviewer asked if Hickenlooper had any inside information that was resulting in Colorado managing expectations about its chances of success, uh, he took issue with that suggestion. No, no, I have no inside information. They are, uh, you know, I have some uh, executives here who know Jeff Bezos and, and, 
you know, he, he is not communicating to anybody, as close as I can tell. Or if he is, he's not communicating to the people that I know. Uh, but I think it's, there are a lot of great cities in America, and there are a lot of, I mean, it's a healthy competition in that sense. Uh, and I think, in the end, our chances, what do you think? You tell me, one in ten? It's, got, it's with so much competition and so much at stake in some of the other cities, again, we, we're never going to offer $7 billion of incentives, right? We, we're, we just don't offer that level of incentives. What we try to demonstrate is this is one of the highest qualities of life. This is one of the most desired locations for young professionals mm -hmm. uh, in America. And that, you know, that's over the long term, that's going to be much more powerful whether they get a puny billion dollars here or a billion dollars there. That's a taste of why we love Hickenlooper here in Colorado when he <laughs> gets into talking about a puny billion dollars here or there. The Irish betting site Paddy Power this week lists Atlanta and Austin as tied with the best odds of landing HQ2. Those odds are listed as 3-1, to one, according to Paddy Power. Boston is next at 7-1, to one, followed by a four-way tie for third place among Washington, D.C., New York City, Portland, Oregon, and Pittsburgh. Those cities all have odds of 14-1. to one. If you like long odds, you might want to go for the two cities listed at 100-1 to one odds, Halifax, Nova Scotia, and Melbourne, Ontario. Australia. I think the biggest surprise to me on that list is Portland, Oregon, because it's so close to Seattle, but uh, maybe the reduction in travel time would be a big advantage. I have a feeling we'll probably know the location of HQ2 by mid-year, maybe by June. Now that Darlene and I are settling back into Denver, I've had a chance to explore the brand new Whole Foods store that opened up while we were in New England. It's about four blocks from our apartment, and it features an Amazon pop-up store as well as a wall of Amazon lockers right as you enter the store. I tried the lockers today when I returned a pair of Crocs shoes that were too small for me. I'd ordered them in size 9 and size 10 because I usually wear a 9.5. When printing out the return order, I saw that I could take the box to an Amazon locker at Whole Foods, as well as several other locations near us here in Denver. The label I printed out had a code on it that I was able to scan in below a screen on the locker's wall. A door opened up high into the left of where I was standing, but that locker was too small for the box. The screen offered a place to tap labeled locker too small or something like that. And when I tapped on that, I didn't see anything happening. I was just sort of standing there looking confused, and a woman that was close to me politely pointed to a door that had opened at floor level to my left. Sure enough, it had plenty of room for my my box, which I placed in the locker and closed the door. I wanted to buy something at the pop-up store, but I have just about one of everything that they sell. I did forget to bring an Alexa smart plug with me from Cambridge, and there's a light in the living room here that I'd like to turn on and off by using my voice and Alexa. There were two Amazon clerks on duty tonight, uh, they helped me choose a Wemo Wi-Fi smart plug for $35. Denver turns out to be a great place if uh, you're a fan of Amazon services. We've got Amazon Fresh, the, even the Amazon Key, which I probably would not be able to use here in our building because it's important to have the locks be all uniform. I haven't talked about it with the building manager yet, but I might give it a shot. Who knows? In addition to the ticking of my great-grandfather's clock, there's a saxophone player out there down on the mall. And here's 10 o'clock chiming the sonorous tones of a clock that's been keeping time for a hundred years. Not bad. So for the tech tip, I've got, uh, I want to talk to you about bookmarks. Uh, lately I have been using them a lot more in a, a specific book that I'm using. And I have actually become irritated because bookmarks act differently among my Kindle Oasis, Kindle HD tablets, and iPhone. To me, that's user unfriendly because it means I have to remember how to create and move to bookmarks using three different procedures on three different devices. That's a source of friction that I'd like to see eliminated in future software updates. Uh, to, to illustrate what I'm talking about, I'm going to describe how you move to a place in a Kindle book that you have bookmarked. On the Oasis, you tap on the top margin of the page to reveal the control panel. At the right side, you will see a bookmarks 
icon that looks like two bookmarks, one on top of the other, a nicely intuitive symbol. When you tap on the bookmarks icon, you will see your existing bookmarks with a handy naming of the chapter name beneath each one of them. If you tap on one of the bookmarks, a reduced view of the page will appear, similar to the way pages look in page flip mode. If you tap on the page, you will be able to begin reading. So the total number of taps required to go from where you are to another location that you have bookmarked is four. Now let's try bookmarks on a Fire HD 8, same for the Fire HD 10. To see the controls, you tap somewhere in the middle of the page that you're reading. You then tap on a bookmark icon that just has one bookmark, not two on it. That difference seems a little odd to me. Would it be so hard to have the bookmarks icon exactly the same on the Kindle and the Fire? Don't these teams ever have pizza together? In any event, if you tap on the Fire bookmarks icon, it brings up a list of your existing bookmarks. They are, uh, they're identified by page number instead of chapter title, but there's also a few words from the beginning of the text on that bookmark page, so that might be a helpful way to recall which bookmark takes you to where you want to go. When you tap on one of the fire bookmarks, it also shows a reduced size image of that page, which you have to tap on to make the bookmarks list go away. Then you have to tap once more to open the page for reading. So total taps to move by bookmarks to a new page on the Fire HD 8, 5. Now let's try the iPhone Kindle app, which was updated with considerable fanfare in October of last year. You tap the middle of the page to show the controls, but if you tap on the bookmark icon at the right, you will not see your existing bookmarks. Tapping on the iPhone's bookmark icon will add or remove a bookmark on that particular page. That's a big difference in how the similar looking icon acts on the iPhone compared with the other two devices. In order to go to an existing bookmark, do not tap on the bookmark icon. Icon. Instead, tap on the icon just to the left of it. It looks like a printed page with the upper right corner turned down. This brings up something called My Notebook that includes your highlights, notes, and bookmarks. If you have a lot of annotations on that list that are not bookmarks, you are going to want to tap on Filter and then tap on Bookmarks. Then tap on X to close the My Notebook page. This will show you just your bookmarks. When you see the one you want, tap on it, then tap on the reduced view of the page to read. That is a total of seven taps required to move to a new location using bookmarks on the supposedly new and improved iPhone Kindle app. Of course, if you read your Kindle books on just one device, these differences in how bookmarks work won't bother you. But I, I think a lot of people read on a smartphone and one other device, often a Kindle. It would help us lose ourselves better in a Kindle story if we didn't have to remember these small and irritating differences in how to do something as simple as navigate by bookmarks. You know, in a paper book, uh, you, you use a bookmark exactly the same way no matter what the book is you're reading. And I think this is an area where the Kindle platform could use some improvement. Tom Semple prefers to keep details of his current employment private. He does work as a software quality engineer in California, and he has been a longtime contributor to the show, offering detailed analysis of advances in the Kindle and other devices. I reached him at home by Skype on Wednesday, January 4th, and began by asking uh, his impression of recent Kindle firmware updates. It was kind of a minor update for most of them. The uh, Bluetooth ones got Audible, the Audible feature. Pretty much all the enhanced typography stuff is in place on all the recent Kindles and the iOS app and the Android app. That, to me, was a big milestone when they they you know, managed to look, make it look pretty work and act pretty much the same across those platforms. Everything else is gravy at this point. And, um, you know, because I don't see myself using audible on my kindle <laughs> you know? yeah i i mean i do it's great on my phone but it's like why would i do that on my kindle when it's so easy to to do it on the phone yeah and i, I think they get a lot more traction if they added text to speech yeah you know just plain old text to speech uh, voiceover is great for the people that need that but um it does change the way you navigate and so it's for the people that just want to break from, give their eyes a break and listen for a while, it would be nice to turn that on on a Kindle. Do you think that's just a, a software uh, update they could do, or the, the hardware would be all available to do it? Yeah, well, they well on the Bluetooth devices, obviously they have Audible, so they have audio, and then the paper, the newest Paperwhite and the Voyage also have audio through the USB port, but I don't know if they want to mess with that. But I, I 
they could do that. <laughs> <laughs> they do it on the, the fire tablets and you know, they can do text to speech or voiceover, so why not why not both? They got the voice files on there and Yeah. She seems like they could do it. Whatever. Uh, I'm not, it's not a real high priority for me. I've noticed that the uh, annotations page, when you go to read.amazon.com slash notebook, it's really prettier than it ever was. you got cover art for each book, and you can search books, and you see your notes and highlights. Uh, but the one thing we can't do yet is to uh, get all of that on a personal document that we've sent to Kindle. It's in Kindle format. It shows up on the Manage My Devices and Content, but I can't see the annotations on anything except what I bought in the Kindle store, apparently. I mean, you can export your ant notes and annotations. Oh, that's right. The Kindle is restricted to just Kindle store, but for the Fire, Fire um, iOS and Android, you can export directly from the book. To, you know, via email or whatever sharing you want to use on that. And so you get a little file, a PDF or a RTF file. So, so I think that's, and that works for personal documents as well. So I, I don't really care about the uh, new site, whatever it's called. <laughs> I, I've only been there once or twice, but I, I think the most convenient thing is just to use the export option when you, you're done Well, that's right. And that would be, uh, you know, I have a a writer friend and she sends me manuscripts and I annotate and send it back. And I could easily do that export from the device. Probably the only advantage is if I had a series of documents that I had annotated and if they ended up at that website, uh, read.amazon.com slash notebook, it would just be handy to have them all there and to access the annotations the way I can on my Kindle books. Yeah, so that'll have location or page number references for all of them and yeah uh, so you can work with it and the other thing that's across all platforms now is is the goodreads integration so yeah i mean all platforms meaning not windows or mac but just uh ios fire android kindle and so they've added the up upload of your notes to goodreads if you you want to share them that's right what i would like is a return of the sharing where they they get pulled down and you can see them in your the book you're reading you know the people you're following they used to have they had that feature i think it's still there if you <laughs> if they haven't taken the website down you can still follow people but it was so horrible to do it that way and now they've got goodreads uh, you know accumulating those those uh notes and highlights that people are sharing. That it makes sense to, to, to have Goodreads be the vehicle for doing that, that if I, people that I follow on Goodreads, I could have their annotations show up in a book I'm reading on my Kindle. That'd be kind of cool. That's what I'd like to see, because the other thing was like a, a very uh, future-looking, but it, didn't, it was hard to use it, and nobody used it, really. Somehow the Goodreads uh, would talk to the Amazon kindle you know cloud and then uh so as new notes come in it would sync those down from goodreads as well somehow and then they would just show up in your notes and highlights yeah you know with the name of the person who you were following and that i think that would be really cool I suppose not everybody's going to be reading the same book, so the number of times one of the people that you've followed it would be not not synchronous just you know uh, you know, you say, oh, I want to read that book, and then you want to see the notes from um, maybe even from the author who annotated Ooh, a book that cool. they read, an, an author, yeah. or some of the authors. It would be just interesting to see see what's going on with that, another way to connect with people and, and uh, connect authors and readers. That would be really smart. I think that would be the next level of Goodreads. Uh, the integration with the Kindle has been pretty impressive over the past few years, but that, that I think, would be a, a really significant improvement. Hmm. Have you read many Kindle in Motion books? I've probably about a dozen of them, yeah. What do you think? I think it's kind of cool for some material. It's fun, but not every all reading is fun. <laughs> it needs mm-hmm. to be fun. <laughs> like, uh, you know, there's the Scott Pierzynski, you know, with the space shots. That was yeah. kind of nice. And uh, there's this one called Off, Off to Be the Wizard. 
it's a series of books, and the first one is a Kindle in Motion, and so you, ha- you have these little, little animations in there. Yeah. And I guess the Harry Potter books are now. I haven't looked at any of those, but uh, there's a animated edition of it. It might have some serious applications, too, with, like, textbooks, if you want to see, um, I don't know, mathematical graphs, graphing, and stuff like that. I realized the problem that it has, this uh, Dean Kuntz has a uh, Kindle original or Amazon original, and it has some pretty striking graphics that illustrate this dark story that he published and the problem is, depending on how big your font size is, you can be reading along in the story, and the graphic that goes with that part of the story shows up two pages later, or sometimes it shows up a page earlier, so it's like a spoiler. Huh. And so I think it, it's it's pretty challenging to... Uh, it, the best use of one of those nice Kindle in Motion graphics would be right as you're reading the text for that scene. Yeah, I think... I, I don't know, I suspect they may be goofed up on the formatting and it's instead of inline it was just sort of stuck those two the tools the tools are not you know available to to the common masses so i don't know exactly how they put them together but it seems like um just a more general case of where we don't really have widow and orphan control like you have yeah the cat captions don't necessarily display on the same picture page as mm-hmm. the, the picture they describe and the title can be <laughs> off on its own on one page. That's something they could improve, I think. Um, that would be the one last like typography thing to do, just mm. to uh, either do that with some heuristics. It seems like they could do it with heuristics. and. Figure what are out heuristics? It. Well, just uh, rules of thumb where they say, oh, well, this looks like it's a header, so maybe I don't want to put it as the last line on this page. I'll move it I to see. the next page right or or you know i only have one one line on this page maybe i should bo- pull pull another line off the previous page you know just yeah. to, that's kind of how that you know print books work and it looks nice so that's some some room for improvement there it only works in portrait basically yeah orientation so yeah it locks you into that so I, I, I would I would definitely not want it on every single book, but yeah. <laughs> and it, they're also rather large. Typically, they're like you know ten times bigger than a normal book because of all the graphics or whatever they put in there. I mean, the Kuntz book you read for like ten pages or more before you hit another one, and that seems to be about the right uh, frequency, both for keeping the the file size down and and interrupting the text. How are you reading these days? I'm about 50-50 between my iPhone and uh, Kindle Voyage. A little bit on my iPad, but usually I use that for other things, other kind, you know, magazines and just other things. <laughs> <laughs> Reference books and things like that. Now, the Voyage is one generation newer than the Paperwhite or, or older than the Paperwhite? It's the same generation as the Paperwhite. The Paperwhite is newer uh, the latest Paperwhite is newer. It's their seventh generation, and then there's the Oasis, the first Oasis, and Kindle. The you know yeah. seventy nine dollar Kindle is our, our eighth generation, and now we have the new Oasis, which is ninth. And uh, yeah, I looked at the Oasis, the new one over at the Amazon Books in San Jose over here. And uh-huh. I, you know, I, I just, I just don't need it. I, I really, you know, my voyage is really great. I don't really have any complaints about it. So, uh, if something happened to it, I'd probably get one. But other than that, I, I'm happy to keep using it. Do you have, uh, Alexa in your home? Yeah, I've got three of them. How are you using them? Well, mostly my wife uses it to put music on and ask what time it is and what the weather is, and I do music as well, mostly. Sometimes make calls on it. I haven't done much of that. What's the, so the idea there is? So you have to take take your iPhone or Android phone and sync the contacts uh, to the Alexa app, or I think that's how it works, and then it, you can just say call. Uh, you know, mom or whatever, and it and it doesn't need you know the phone around at all. It will just do it. It's just like a speaker phone. 
What's what's a situation where you use that that it's actually an advantage to when like my wife and I want to be on the same call together and we don't want to have right. phones held up to our ears. <laughs> you know, we can all, yeah. everybody can just be. And are you using the full size echoes with a better speaker? Yeah, for that uh, we have the original echo. That's the only one I've used for it, but um, I have two taps. I mean, two dots. Uh, first generation dot and a second generation dot, which is um, yeah, they look slightly different. I don't know what they do different. <laughs> they have different buttons yeah. on them, or something like this. Uh, they're basically equivalent. I have one hooked up to speakers here, and music. Uh, I think you've given me some tips in the past on interesting music to get, but are you using? Prime Music or Spotify or what? What's your music source these days? It's mostly Spotify. I, I like their apps better than the Amazon Music app. So there's like this feature called Spotify Connect. Uh, you can just go, move from one device to another seamlessly. You know, like you launch the app on another device and it says, "Oh, you're listening on this device. Do you want to listen the one you're holding in your hand now?" So you can just switch and it'll just pick up and with the same playlist or whatever you were playing. It works. It's uh, very nicely integrated with the Echo. Uh, so anything you can do, you know, you can say play this playlist or this artist, and, and it'll or this album, and it'll. Does the music selection seem comparable between the two? I couldn't say. I don't have Amazon Music subscription, but as far as I can tell, they're pretty much all the streaming services are um, like ninety nine percent the same in terms of the content. So it's it's more about. For me, it's just more, uh, I guess, about the app, you know, and, and I wouldn't, I, I, I mean, I like having, like it that it works with the Echo as well, as, or, you know, nearly as well as um, Amazon Music, and then I can also, and it's just got this other <laughs> kind of feature where I can start, you know, like I can be in San Jose and I can start something playing in my house <laughs> and, <laughs> and surprise <laughs> The people there, so it's it's uh, or I can see what they're playing. I think it's a similar cost. Yeah, it's it's it, well, unless you're a Prime member, you save a couple of bucks. But to me, that's not really. Uh, and I do like, you know, the lyrics that that you get with uh, some of the Amazon music. Yeah, the Echo Show is nice for that. You can see the lyrics. With Spotify, it doesn't really do that. They have they've started hmm. doing selected lyrics. What does that mean? It's just some of the lyrics of a song? It'll just have, some songs will have lyrics, but they don't like scroll along with it. It'll just kind of page through and then they'll have like um, information about the artist that pops up and things like yeah. that. So it, but it's maybe, it's almost none of the stuff I listen to has that stuff. <laughs> it's, you have to be listening to popular music and yeah. mostly listening to instrumental music, classical, jazz, different kinds of bluegrass, whatever, you know. There's a, been a couple of uh, think pieces I've seen coinciding with the 10-year anniversary of the Kindle, and it seems like a common approach is uh, the Kindle's great, it's been 10 years, and how come Amazon hasn't revolutionized reading more than uh, than they have? And I, it strikes me as <laughs> perplexing. I just can't, when I see the amount of changes in how I read with a Kindle, you know, from spelling to, to all the rest. Uh, and I was even, uh, yeah. I think I was reading a, a children's book for some reason, and that business where they put the definitions between the lines, if you wanted, it's sort of like a word vocabulary builder and you can dial it back so it only puts really hard words in versus easy words a pretty sophisticated tool but the accumulation of those kinds of improvements it seems to me they really have changed reading they haven't just taken what's on a page and put it on a screen yeah it's to me it's enhanced reading you know it's like i you have a book some books there's just some authors use a lot of fancy words and uh in the past with a book, I would just, you know, kind of say, oh, I think it probably means this or that. <laughs> and, and, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, now you can just look them up, and uh, it's just really convenient. And then if you're studying foreign languages, you can translate sentences or look up words with one of the dictionaries that comes with it. You know, you can't do that with a book. you got to have another book <laughs> to look things up. Yeah. And then, so... I, I don't know. I just th find it 
um, perplexing, as you say. What, I mean, what do the, what do people think reading is supposed to be if they, are, you know, if they're if somebody had, I mean, they're called movies or they're called <laughs> video games. You know, that's that's another thing entirely. And uh, you know, but I think um, I don't really know where you would go. Um, from here, if you're just interested in text and, uh, you know, a purely textual experience with, um, I don't really see any need to goose it up very much. I mean, there's a few things, I guess. I mean, for example, Google Playbooks has some, some of the books are indexed by the locations are indexed. So when you tap on them and can, you can bring up a map th- thumbnail. So like you can read, it'll show you, you know, a particular, you know, Par- here's Paris or here's, <laughs> here's London or yeah. here's, yeah. here's what this place is. And I, I think that would be something they could add to the tablet apps anyway, because they all have yeah. an app application on there. So, um, that would be fun. Um, cause sometimes when I'm reading, I, Maybe I'm not paying attention, but I, I, you know, they're moving through a city, and I just want to see where they are. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but but it's totally, you know, it'd be totally optional. It wouldn't be something that's kind of like in your face, but just another uh, reference at your disposal. I've had a feeling that uh, sometimes I think, well, why am I doing this podcast? What am, what am I trying to accomplish? And it's it's part of it is to help people appreciate ebooks and and i thought you know when i look at the way my wife reads a, her kindle she doesn't use any of the tools that uh, that i use a lot of i know i i i wonder if some kind of teaching of people uh you know to say hey did you realize you can do this with that and and that if there was some kind of an organized effort to help people to understand the things they could do reading on a Kindle, that uh, it would somehow, that maybe the adoption rate would go up. It, it's sometimes surprising that it seems like it's plateaued at a, a, a smaller percentage of total reading than I think you know we might have thought it was going to do 10 years ago. And maybe it's just because people haven't gotten the word about the satisfactions that that are available to reading this way but it takes a little effort to learn how to use them and 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 especially how to become natural with them so that you're not having to think about it you're just you know everybody learned how to tap on a word and see the definition but to get that level of familiarity is uh it's a bit of a lift i think for a lot of people to get to a higher level of skill using these tools yeah uh, somebody needs to do some YouTube or something. Yeah, could have Kindle University for. Uh, yeah. Now that might be the way I'd finally make some money out of this podcast. <laughs> I, could, <laughs> I could grant a degree, a, a Kindle, a master's in Kindleography. I think. Um, I mean, the other part of this is is audiobooks for me too. So, mm. I I think those could be improved. I mean, it's primarily an or you know listening, but. I'd like to see something called X-ray for audiobooks. So, like, you wow. could, you could uh, it could pop up. You know, you're sitting. You know, if you're able to actually interact with it, you would be able to see. They could put up. Well, here's the names of the characters, and you know, it'll jump to the places in the book where they're mentioned. Maybe. And you'd be seeing this on your screen of the device that you're listening to. Yeah. Yeah. Because audiobooks are kind of hard to navigate. You can't find things, right? You have to just listen to it linearly. But if with uh, the X-ray it's serving as an index, you could flip through the references and maybe top tap it, and it would read that, <laughs> read a sentence out from that, and then you could just go back to where you were. I think, and they they kind of have all the pieces. They just have to put them together. Well, and they have X-ray for the video content on Amazon. It be, could be similar to that. Right, and then. A lot of books have notes, um, and the the Windows app actually has a link to pull up the PDF on the web. So you can, you know, like if you're listening to some, um, like the Great Courses or something like that, it'll open that up, and so you can refer to that. 
Um, and then, oh, so then, then the other feature is called real chapter titles. <laughs> <laughs> so like, well, so audiobooks, they just say chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter three. I want to, you know, one of the books that have actual chapter names, it would yeah. be nice to be able to see chapter names. And because uh, oh. depending on the, the audio, yeah. book, they aren't necessarily uh, organized into chap- the same chapters that the, the printed book is. And so you kind of lose the, you lose that kind of context. That's right. Um, so I think that would be helpful. Just, just to, to hit, I mean, I, I, I literally, I think they could just take the same X-ray file that's indexed to the audio book and then just overlay it, and then you could just um, either have it follow along. Yeah. So that that's just another idea for them. <laughs> Good. Well, I think it's good to leave them with some ideas, especially at the start of the year. And uh... Oh, there's one more. One more idea. All right, we'll end with one more. This would be some kind of automatic collections, right? So, so like any books that are still on uh, the beginning of the book, they could be auto-collected into To Be Read. Yeah. Anything that you got to the end to could just be in a Ooh. collection called you know, I'm Done With Reading This One. I love that. And then everything in the in between, you know, is... You're reading it now. Currently reading. Other reading apps uh, will collect series books into a collection. Uh-huh. Uh, so they, they could do that. You could collect nonfiction versus fiction. Well, yeah. So then the other thing is they could just basically organize them into genres or categories based on how they're organized in the Kindle store. And you could just turn on mm-hmm. a view that shows your library organized into those categories if you just want to... Yeah. do it that way and then I think most people probably wouldn't even need to do any custom ones I'm sure there's plenty of people that don't do collections but then the people that do do them are always complaining about I can't do this and I can't do that or, <laughs> I want to they want to organize them hierarchically or uh, things like this in folders I still get confused when I do collections on a device they don't necessarily show up on another device but there are also cloud collections, and I've never sort of been able to get my head around how to use a cloud collection. Can I just make a cloud collection and pull it down to all of my devices if that's the the hierarchy that I want? So no, um, the a- iOS app you can open a collection and then say download all the books in it. Okay. And you can also go to manage your Kindle and push books down to devices from there right but um i don't particularly want them on all of my devices i just there's a you know because there's books i read on the, my phone because it has an audiobook or something like this or makes sense for whatever reason i want to see color or things yeah. like that so i i switch back and forth and some some books i have on both but i don't really um i'm not really worried about that the other part of those, I wish there were a way to remove books <laughs> from all your devices. You know, like when from Manager Kindle, I want to, you know, remove it from all the devices it's currently on. And next oh. time they connect to the internet, you'd have to go device by de- by device to do that. Yeah, you, you have to manually, a- physically have access to the device. Mm-hmm. And if you're lending out devices to friends or family, then you can't retrieve them or you know maybe you don't even know where the device you know the device isn't anywhere near yeah but you run into you know the five uh copy limit or whatever the publisher is set on there and then you try to download it to a new one and you, you know won't let you do it so either so d- either a way to remove it from all uh, without deregistering the device that mm-hmm. obviously would do it because you don't really know which Devices, it's on. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's the problem. That's the problem. So just remove it from everything, and then I'll start from scratch. And when I'm finished reading it, I'd like to be able to remove it from all devices. So they have that functionality for samples. So when you delete a sample from one device, you can say, "Well, delete it from all devices." Oh. And you can say yes. So they've already done. And that would help. That would just help mm-hmm. manage things yeah, better because exactly. otherwise you have to go you have to individually delete from each device yeah. 
and uh, so that that's another one I'd like to see. But um, anyway, the, and the, I, I, these are just <laughs> little picky things because uh, you know it's just come a long way in ten years. I think it's as as good as any of the reading systems out there from the competition. There are some, you know. Uh, one one got developer apps out there that are have are very feature rich and they let you get do all these kind of fine grain control of the fonts and use your own fonts and <laughs> margin control and all this kind of stuff. But um, for the I think for most people uh, it's a pretty good platform for reading. And they, they keep it. Oh, yeah, and I want to see. I want I want Word Runner on the iPhone, though. <laughs> I like to play. I, like, I want to play with that. That's right. I didn't realize it wasn't on there. I've used it on the fire a few times when I'm nodding off and I really need to finish something. It, yeah, and I, I don't carry my fire around very much these days. Yeah. And I, I'm too lazy to. I have an Android phone, but I'm just too lazy to pull it yeah. out. I just don't want to carry all these devices around. And, uh, keep them charged up. And well, good. So. Well, I think we've planted some seeds here, and maybe we'll uh, touch base in a year. And, and, and in 10 years from now, I hope we're both uh, paying attention and we can look back and see what the second 10 years has been like. So good talking to you, Tom. Have a happy new year. Yeah, it's been it's a good one here so far. In content, I want to let you know that David Ignatius, who spoke with us two months ago on TKC 483, will be talking about his new book, The Quantum Spy, on C-SPAN's book TV show tomorrow, Sunday, January 7th at noon Eastern Time. Also in content, listener John Aga noted that the BBC iPlayer app that Mark Jarvis mentioned two weeks ago is available for Amazon Fire tablets. I'll have a link to it in the show notes. Next week's guest will be the best-selling author, Dean Kuntz, whose debut publication with Amazon Publishing is an Amazon original titled Ricochet Joe. Uh, In closing, I want to dedicate this show to the memory of Joseph Foligno, the father of my 11-year-old grandson, James. Joe passed away unexpectedly at his home in Watertown, Massachusetts, three days ago at the age of 43. My daughter's, Sarah's ex-husband, Joe, was tall, shy, brilliant, kind, and a devoted father to my grandson. He met Sarah while earning his B.A. in English at Brown University in Providence. Sixteen years ago, he wrote the preface to a book that my mother published privately titled Favorite Poems, a Family Portrait, edited by my nephew, Seth. Each of us in the family selected a favorite poem, and Joe introduced the collection in the preface. I'd like to close this episode by sharing what he wrote. It is hard to pick a favorite poem. It is hard sometimes even to define what poetry is. It can be carefully rhymed and meticulously metered, or an amorphous cascade of unrelated words. Some of us were forced to memorize poems as children, only to be surprised later in life by how useful those half-remembered phrases can be. Some members of the extended Edgerly family are poets themselves, while others have let their favorite volumes grow dusty, preferring to spend their time with prose. What is it then that ties this book together? We might as well ask, what ties this family together? Blood, to be sure, but family, through marriage and adoption, encompasses far more than this narrow definition would allow. Love, then, and familiarity. Yet some of the people who contributed to this book have barely met their more distant relations. Family, like poetry, is something that transcends simple definitions. Nevertheless, everyone who contributed to this book is bound to everyone else, just as Shel Silverstein's playful verse shares a kinship with Shakespeare's grandest sonnets. And this book resembles nothing so much as a family portrait, a gathering together at a particular moment of time, Just as one's hairstyle may have changed since that last family portrait, so do one's favorite poems change over the years. But this collection, this family snapshot, bears witness to the beauty and diversity of the people in it as they are now. We can cherish it as such and learn about one another from the choices that were made. This portrait, preserved on paper instead of film, shall prove as enduring and revealing as any definition of family can be. 
Joe Foligno, March 2001. At James's suggestion, the family has requested donations to the Animal Rescue League of Boston in lieu of flowers. Darlene and I will fly back to Boston on Monday night to attend Joe's funeral in Cambridge on Thursday. Tonight, I'd welcome your prayers of gratitude for the life of Joseph R. Foligno. Rest in peace, Joe.